Here are some of the scams that happen when disasters strike. Number five, Erica Prince. You might think someone who knew how hard life could be, such as Erica Prince, might have a little compassion for those in need. Clearly, she only cared about herself and those around her when she devised a scam to steal funds meant for victims of some of the most devastating hurricanes in U.S. history. Erica lived in Section 8 housing in Houston, Texas, along with several others in her criminal ring. Section 8 is a program in which low-income families are helped with their rent when living in privately owned complexes or housing projects. Erica decided she needed more assistance from FEMA. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, is the agency called in when a disaster overwhelms state and local government resources and response capability. When the governor declares a state of emergency after a disaster, FEMA swoops in. You can think of it as the bat signal for the government. FEMA provides on-the-ground support, special low-interest loans, emergency funds. They even provide preparedness training so victims are ready when the inevitable hurricane, earthquake, or wildfire happens again. According to court documents, Erica instilled a large group of fellow scammers to pull this off, and nine participants were formally charged. On August 24th, 2005, one of the most notorious hurricanes in history would make a second landfall, bringing widespread destruction with it. Hurricane Katrina was a Category 3 hurricane by that time, but its landfall decimated both Mississippi and Louisiana. Katrina would become the catastrophic catalyst that showed the world the flaws in the New Orleans levee system and deadly negligence by many government agencies, local, state, and federal. Searches were still underway for Katrina victims by the time Hurricane Rita slammed into the coast of Beaumont, Texas on September 24, 2005, devastating the coastline and anything in its wake as a another Category 3 storm, Rita made history as the most intense tropical cyclone on record for the Gulf Coast of Mexico. State of emergency was an understatement in the aftermath of these storms. Resources were spread thin and chaos ensued, leaving the door wide open for the greedy and heartless to manipulate the crippled relief efforts. Prince, who was not a resident of the areas affected by either of these storms, was the ringleader that would file over 70 FEMA applications for disaster assistance. So how did they do it? Prince got the entire apartment building and neighboring complexes in on her scam. She recruited her team of nine to venture out and obtain social security numbers and birth dates from anybody willing to hand them over. She then filed FEMA claims in their names claiming property damage in New Orleans and Beaumont. How she thought she'd get away with it is hard to question. Most of the people involved in her scam were also living in Section 8 housing in the Houston area, thus unlikely that they own property in Beaumont or New Orleans. She thought she had it all figured out, having the FEMA checks sent to her address or a mailbox at an apartment complex where a fellow scammer had given her a key. Prince would then accompany the scammer listed on the application, cash the checks, and take her cut. Little did she know, the Hurricane Katrina and Rita task force were zeroing in on fraudulent claims. Authorities caught up with Prince and her ring of scammers. She was sentenced to 33 months in prison, ordered to pay $92,000 in restitution, and forfeit her Lincoln Navigator bought with the stolen funds. Number four, Stephen and Bartholomew Stevens. PayPal is a safe, trusted, and convenient way to send and receive funds worldwide making it a helpful way to send donations for a good cause without worry. Sadly, Stephen and Bartholomew Stevens, natives of Houston, Texas, jumped on the bandwagon of scammers who also saw the disasters of Hurricane Katrina and Rita as a meal ticket. PayPal was going to be their golden goose. The Stevens brothers played on this public trust and foolishly underestimated PayPal's commitment to protecting its customers from fraud. Stephen and Bartholomew created a fake Salvation Army website where they asked for donations on behalf of the victims of the catastrophic storms. The Stevens brothers created several PayPal accounts with stolen identities to receive donations straight to their personal bank accounts. Over 250 victims of the donation scheme were quite charitable, thinking their money was going towards hurricane victims in need. This allowed Stephen and Bartholomew to collect $48,000 from their scam effort. To make it all seem legit, the brothers submitted bank statements to PayPal. However, they copy-pasted stolen identities all over their name. It didn't take long for PayPal and the feds to catch on, and PayPal froze all the associated accounts. The only thing now being donated to these brothers was justice. For Stephen, that was 63 months in federal prison, while his brother Bartholomew only received 57. Both men were convicted on numerous charges of wire 
fraud. To finish off their stints in prison, each would have to serve two more years for aggravated identity theft. Once they were released from prison, both brothers had to serve three years of supervised release. Number three, click jacking. We have all heard fishing stories that over-exaggerate the size of the fish. In this case, the fish, or whale, was non-existent, though another type of fishing was going on. When you see a curiosity-inducing headline, click the link to the content, and the content is not about the headline or is fake, that is clickbait. When that click is loaded with malicious and sneaky intentions, like enabling a system to steal your information or steal like and post on your behalf, it becomes clickjacking. On March 11, 2011, the earthquake often referred to as 311 and a subsequent tsunami broke the record as the most powerful earthquake ever in Japan. With the tsunami wave reaching 133 feet and the death toll of the entire catastrophe claiming 20,000 lives, the world took notice. Unfortunately, so did the scammers. Soon, a supposedly crazy video went viral and a link popped up all over social media. The video supposedly showed a whale being thrown by the tsunami clean out of the ocean before slamming into the side of a building. As expected, millions of people clicked on it. However, when they clicked it, they were actually pressing the like button on a different Facebook post and unknowingly sharing the link to their news feed. Of course, there was never any video, only redirects to another page that tried to sell iPads and get you to take surveys. This lucrative and unassuming scam is said to make some clickjackers more than $1 million a month. So how does it work? How do scammers steal clicks? Every one of those crazy crazy too-good-to-be-true videos will almost always come with a quick question survey. Sometimes it's, are you 18 years or older? Or something to do with verifying your age. Because these viral videos tend to be graphic, it's reasonable to assume one must be old enough to view them. However, when you click the yes I'm 18 button, you're actually clicking the like or share button on a Facebook page you've probably never heard of. This will also share the clickjacking link to your Facebook page for your friends and followers to fall victim to. Even naturally, Natural disasters can't keep these greedy scam artists at bay. So remember, seems too good to be true, it probably isn't. Number two, Beatrice Kaufman. For some, it's never enough. Once again, we have a low-life millionaire who decided it was okay to take advantage of 9-11. Beatrice Kaufman is an elderly millionaire who splits time between her 6,000-square-foot Manhattan apartment and a country home in the Hamptons. She owns a successful employment agency for lawyers, at least successful enough to afford her lavish lifestyle. After 9-11, Kaufman filed several duplicate claims of displacement, damages, and anything she could come up with to both insurance and relief agencies. When she eventually was busted for the fraud, she insisted she knew nothing and only signed documents her accountant told her to. Ah, the old, my accountant made me do it excuse. Prosecutors were not buying it and were not going to allow over $500,000 in relief funds to be used on Kaufman's apartment renovations. Drawers full of letters and instructions to Kaufman's accountant were uncovered and brought into court. This evidence was in Kaufman's handwriting, even detailing claims for a specific teapot from Barney's with a price tag of $200. Eventually, Kaufman acknowledged she was in her country home during the attacks and that her renovations on her multi-million dollar apartment had begun before the attacks on 9-11. In her claim, she stated that she was physically and emotionally unable to return to her New York apartment until February. Coincidentally, that was when her remodeling was scheduled to be done. Kaufman was finally sentenced to 52 weekend stays at Rikers Island in order to pay restitution of $250,000 to the Red Cross. FEMA and Safe Horizon. Did Kaufman's money and affluence have an effect on her punishment? Did her age have anything to do with it? Weekend visits to jail seems a bit light, especially given Kaufman's need to blame anyone but herself. Was this a slap on the wrist feeding into Kaufman's above the law attitude? Number one, Gustavo Vila. He willingly chose to defraud the clients he was trusted to defend. Scamming is never okay, but scamming America's first responders is even worse. 9-11 has made a lasting mark, especially for the first responders who lost their lives on the scene or experienced serious after effects in the years since. The Victims' Compensation Fund, or VCF, assists those who sacrificed so much that day and continue sacrificing because of lingering health conditions. Gustavo L. Vila, an attorney in New York, represented one of these first responders 
responders between 2012 to 2019. The NYPD first responders suffered from severe health conditions, including cancer, as a direct result of his first responder role. A $1 million claim was awarded to the NYPD officer in 2016, but Vila lied to his client, saying that VCF only released $103,062 of the funds. What his client didn't know was Vila had already been disbarred a year prior after being convicted of stealing funds from another client. Vila gave his client the 100000 and pocketed the rest. Vila insisted that VCR was taking its time releasing the funds for three years. Vila showed no remorse for withholding money meant to help the officer with cancer treatments and medical expenses. A U.S. Department of Justice investigation caught on to Vila's scam and brought him to justice. He was sentenced to 51 months in prison, ordered to forfeit $900,000, and pay full restitution to the officer. Click here to watch one of these next videos.